So uh, we wanted to bring you on and talk to you about some of the uh, excitement, I guess, going on with the CFL, XFL chatter and just get your thoughts. Uh, excitement. There's lots of excitement. There's lots of conflict. Um, the funny thing about it is I, I have a background in, in journalism, if people don't know. Um, I, I have a show on TSN, uh, which is all about college football in Canada and the United States. Uh, lots of play-by-play in my background. Uh, we launched the uh, Cornish Trophy for the uh, top Canadian in NCAA football four years ago. We run that in conjunction with the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. So th- there's a combination here of sport and business and, and culture. And when I take a look at this story, it's a fire triangle and it's feeding itself. It, uh, this story's got incredible legs. And, you know, for a fire triangle, you need heat, fuel, and oxygen. Here we have culture, business, and sport. And if we're having a debate about this story, if you take one out, you're not telling the whole story. You got to balance the three off. And it's a tough balancing act for a number of the voices uh, that are involved in it. Um, I'm more than happy to go down any one of those three roads in terms of having a discussion with you guys about it. Um, you know, from an amateur football perspective, I'm also president of, uh, of Football Canada, the governing body for amateur football in the country. Um, you know, I see uh, a combination of opportunity and massive challenges with this. So uh, the, 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 I think the issue right now is we know that they're talking. We know that they're talking about talking, and they may have been doing so for quite some time. So where this is going is anyone's guess. Yeah, it's crazy. I was on uh, Rod Peterson's show yesterday. He had been on our show a, a couple weeks ago, and you know, it's it's almost like at this point, I I kind of became like the defendant yesterday for like The Rock and like all this stuff. I'm like, The Rock does not need me on Canadian anything defending his business acumen or success, right? But all these people coming at me like, you know, what are you talking about? I mean, uh, to say that the interest in our show and the XFL, you know, Paul and I started this back in kind of the dreads of not a lot of news and to say that there's been an explosion of interest from both sides of the border in, in a, I would hope a good way it has been astounding the last uh, couple of weeks. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that the CFL was driving towards with a portion of their 2.0 plan, which was focused on international development. Uh, we know one of the challenges uh, about Canada as a marketplace is that we are limited by 37 million people. Imagine, for, if you will, for 150 years, a sport developing just in California with, with nine teams that draw an average that ranks them third in terms of professional leagues in North America and just did it in California <laughs> and did it in California for that period of time. Um, is it possible? Yes. Is it amazing <laughs> that we do it up here? I think, you know, we actually punch well beyond our weight in terms of what we do uh, with the sport. And, and I think in part that's because there's, you know, I'm going to veer back over to the cultural again. I think people feel there's a portion of people out there that feel that the sport belongs to them. And that's important for Canadians. We live beside the cultural behemoth of the United States, you know, the biggest cultural force on the planet, let's face it. And we have very few things that uniquely belong to Canadians. And I think when, when you get that sort of pushback, that's where it comes from. And, and it, it's, it's an emotional base, but there is some logic to it as well. And quite frankly, I think it's, it, it's, it's patently unfair um, to, to go after the rock or go after Danny Garcia, or it, it, that that's kind of a binary response that we have these days in the social media world. And, and it's, I think it's really quite unfortunate. Um, you know, when the rock, um, replied to, to one of my tweets, yeah. what, one of the great things about that was, okay, I went back and I tried to dig for the story that I was referencing that I heard like months ago about the possibility of, where the XFL could uh, land on the calendar. And I stumbled upon an interview that uh, Danny Garcia was doing uh, with The Rock and uh, with some people from the XFL. One of the first things that they, that they started with was culture. Yep. 
uh, culture around the sport, culture of understanding uh, the the athletes' culture and, and training and being responsive to athletes and being responsive, quite frankly, to their point of view. And if this pillar of what this new league is going to look like, let's just focus on the XFL for a sec or whatever it's going to be. If it's focused on culture, I think they have a fighting chance in in the uh, in the spring season. I, I really liked what I heard there. Well, that that would be my question for you. Is um, and yeah, and it was a phenomenally exciting Saturday night when I saw that our our guest for this week was you know having the dialogue with the Rock, you know, for for better or worse. But because um, you know, I I get a lot of CFL fans now, and because they ask us like, you know, would you be okay with? three downs. Would you be okay with all this? Would you be okay? And I go, yeah, we cover alternative football of any kind. We just cover the Twitch based fan control football league that had five downs. Like we, we cover any of the stuff. And so then I've gotten a lot of response back now. Well, I don't, I'm not like that. I just like the CFL. We don't, we don't want any other football. So it's not even a football debate at that point. It's like a CFL or bus. I mean, do you really think that they, they can turn minds and, and hearts in Canada? In some cases, yes. In some cases, no. Uh, the one thing that I do see on on social media, and, and let's put social media in perspective too, especially Twitter. Only twelve percent of people in North America are actually active on Twitter, uh, and like I said, there's there's binary responses, there's black and white responses within those numbers of characters. Uh, one of the things that I don't see on Twitter right now is the younger demographic that not just the CFL are losing out on. Uh, but uh, spectator sports right across the board are losing out on. Uh, you know, if you take a look at uh, Major League Baseball, they they have a major problem. Minor League Baseball was down for 14 consecutive years until 2019, where they had a minor bump back. NASCAR is really suffering in terms of a demographic drop off. I I, I uh, listed uh, one example in Canada where we have a, we have major junior hockey. It, it's the equivalent of what the NCAA kind of occupies in terms of a in terms of a band. And in the major cities in Western Canada, Vancouver, Calgary, and Edmonton, over the last ten years, Vancouver's down forty five percent in terms of attendance. Uh, Calgary's down 17, Edmonton's down about 12%. Those are, those are things that the CFL are also dealing with. So, so getting back to, to, can you, can you change some minds? You might be able to, to change some minds and bring them along because people like football. Some people are really bonded to that cultural aspect and it will be a turnoff to them. Some of them will go off and watch university football in this country. Uh, but the real point of concern that I have, and this goes over to the business aspect of that triangle, is that pocket of young people that are not just not watching the CFL. They're not watching anything. They're doing other things. They're gaming. They're doing. They're, you know, uh, in a place like Vancouver, like out behind me here, they're doing other things. They're doing other activities. So how do you maybe engage some of those individuals, but then really start on the next generation. And how do you afford that time it's going to take to take you through a system where you deliver fandom? It's it's patient. It's a medium to long-term game. And, and people that think there's a silver bullet out there to solve it are, are absolutely foolhardy. Is it a situation, I want to I want to kind of liken that to what happened here in LA, where the Dodgers went specifically with Sportsnet and it kind of eliminated, you know, people that were on direct TV, these kinds of things. Is it, is it a problem with exposure on TV that's not building that fan base or is it just people are checked out? I think TSN, when they uh, took over all of uh, CFL football, uh, did a fantastic job of uh, repositioning the game and creating destinations for the game uh, in the country. Unfortunately, I think we have cable cutters in uh, in Canada, just like you do in in the United States. And um, I, I think that our culture up here around the business of, uh, of big telcos and broadcast companies who are protected by the government and managed by the government, they're very slow to react. And they, I think they were very slow to react to streaming. And I think that uh, by being slow to react to streaming, they lost a pocket there. It is akin to the first wave of when the CFL started to have troubles. 
in terms of reaching younger fans. There was a wave of it uh, back in the uh, back in the 1980s where blackouts were the thing. I know the NFL fans know what blackouts are. Um, you know, blackouts were 95% of the games in the CFL in certain markets. And when you have Toronto and Hamilton, your largest market within spitting distance of each other, then you only see X number of games because they're blacking each other out in each other's markets. So in terms of that audience reach, yeah, there, there's, there, there's an issue with that. And in terms of news reach, uh, there's an issue with that. I've talked to a few reporters that are uh, not necessarily in that TSN circle, and they feel that they've been pushed to the outside in terms of that uh, communication link that, that happens uh, within uh, the dissemination of news reporting. It's just crazy to me. I mean, we you know we covered the whole because you know before all this, we were covering NFL ratings and money and all that stuff just for figuring out an XFL TV deal. You know what would that look like? I mean, this was you know month or two ago. You know before this was all a thing, and you know where where the NFL now one game is drawing as much money as the entire TSN you know budget contract for the year for CFL. I mean, it's just astounding to us that the NFL is such a king here in this country and it just is not it just doesn't tra- it translate across. It's just odd. It's really hard for us to get our heads around. Uh, you know, the NFL does have that international outreach. That's what the 17th game is all about. Um it, it, that's always been targeted as international. It shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. Um, you know, we've had NFL exhibition games in, in Vancouver. Uh, we've had them in Montreal. We had a World League of American football team in, in Montreal many years ago. And, of course, there was the, quite frankly, the disastrous Bills in Toronto series where, um, man, that was that was mismanaged at, at every turn. Um, the, the NFL has that reach. Um, you know, the CFL, uh, I think it's worth, revisiting what what randy ambrosi's vision of of 2.0 was was that there was a recognition that um the canadian game wasn't going to make big inroads in the american market but there were all these other developing markets and through my experience in in international football um i i I see the same thing Uh, i mean I've, i've I've been in Mexico for a world junior championship between Canada and Mexico for a gold medal game where people are paying $20 a head to see U19s play. And there's 30,515 people there watching the game. There's a great football culture in Mexico City. I'm not sure if you guys had the opportunity to fly into Mexico City, but when you look down in Mexico City, there's American football fields everywhere. They have uh, they have a um, uh, an eighty year history of of college football. College football they've got a great circuit down there uh, that that that's very well supported. So you know in terms of in terms of international strategy, I think Randy was was on to something. I think what what's going on right now is a discussion that probably needs to occur because the business model of the of the CFL isn't making as many inroads as it needs to make internationally that's a slow long build but you know with the with the branding of the rock and with the capital that's there with redbird how would you not have a discussion with these people i think that's i think from the business angle that that's what people who are showing resistance in canada need to understand does without so does the CFL survive without an influx, whether it's The Rock and Danny or, or elsewhere? Do they survive at this point? I mean, you've you've covered them for you know a long time. I I, I think that um, there's issues in Toronto. Uh, even though Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment own that team, I think they've been uh, remarkably uh, disappointed with what's showing up at the gate. Now, the the thing that I'd say about that is that, you know, when I take a look at one of their properties, uh, the American Hockey League's Toronto Marlies, they have the farm team of the Toronto Maple Leafs in the same city. Uh, About eight years ago, they were averaging about 3,900 a game. Uh, Through hard work, through through smart work, and through through great sales, and, and tying those sales to other properties that they have, they've got an average attendance now sitting around 6,200 before the pandemic. They did the work to bring those numbers up. That, that, that sort of medium-term strategy needs to be applied to the CFL. 
uh, in that town and needs to be applied to the Toronto Argonauts. It, 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 <laughs> the, the, the amazing thing that I see about the CFL when you talk about survival <clears throat> is that w- when it's come down to it, especially in the, in the cities in Western Canada, it's about rolling up your sleeves and getting to work. It's not about a magic marketing strategy. It, it, it's it's not about it's not even about strategic thinking. It's about getting out there, getting into people's faces, getting players out in the off season. Um, uh, you know, kissing hands and shaking babies, as I like to say, and and, and going around to the Elks Club and giving speeches and really going one on one into communities. It's a lot of hard work. Uh, CFL players do a lot of hard work in the in the communities, probably more so than any other professional league in in this country. Uh, to to be able to go out and, and really win people uh, one person at a time, especially in this communication age where it's so hard to get people's attention on anything for longer than five five minutes, is actually the path that's going to survive and and, and probably f- uh, thrive. Um, uh, I, I see encouraging signs with the, with, with the talks around the XFL, but I also see a lot of, uh, a lot of roadblocks there too, in terms of that, uh, level of acceptance. A lot of pushback. It seems there's a lot of people that think, you know, who is this American coming in and, and trying to take over our beautiful game. Uh, something that caught my attention was your idea for a smart season. And, um, that just, that's very interesting. I, I liked, I like kind of how the format format was i have my own uh perspective and and choice on what i'd like to see but i like what you did here uh the xfl and cfl playing 10 games then some kind of interleague playoffs for three weeks yeah you know i i worked for fiba for four years in in europe as a as a broadcaster and as a producer and the one thing that that it opened my eyes towards is all different forms of of competition and parallel competitions uh, you you have you have leagues that have that continental competition component, and they have domestic competition. There might even be a solution to uh, some of the concern around ratio, because there are examples about about those two types of competitions having different types of ratio management. So you you may be able to play less Canadian starters when you when you play outside of your country or you play international competition. If that happens to be a be a concern, uh, but uh, in regard to the the basically, I was throwing a conversation piece out there. It, it's a cheap way of doing a marketing survey to try to take the uh, temperature of people out there. Um, you know, you get the usual binary responses. Well, you don't want to take anything from soccer. Well, it's not just soccer. You know, uh, basketball does it. Other sports do that uh, around the world in in different areas. Um, if you want to preserve that 10 game season in the XFL, you can do it with this. Um, if you want to have two bye weeks for teams that don't quote unquote make the playoffs to get to a final, you can do it through this. Uh, if you want to have, um, uh, the eight remaining games just for the CFL teams, you can do it with this. So you have your 18 game season. Um, to, to get the number of games down, I would suggest, and this is probably one of the things the CFL is pursuing with the XFL right now, is how do we combine our training camps and rationalize costs through training camps? So you have controlled scrimmages at that level instead of exhibition games or preseason games. So you're taking those two preseason games off of the schedule and you're, and you're adding an interleague championship component uh, in, in, in the middle of July, right? So my main concern with this is when does the CFL season end? Probably, you know, I had a tracking all the way into to early November to try to get that traditional date. But if you if you remove a number of bye weeks and just throw one bye week in there, you could you could do it in oh in late on Labor Day, which is traditionally a really big day for the CFL, the unofficial start of, of the season. Uh, I think you take a lot away from the, or possibly take a lot away from the from the Grey Cup um, festivities and, and Grey Cup week, which is a um, probably our, quite frankly, our biggest national crossroads and meeting place. I really, when we get the Grey Cup going, you guys got to come up for that. Oh, definitely. By the way. Yeah. 
<laughs> I saw, I you saw know. people are sending me Shania Twain getting pulled out on a dog sled. I mean, that's, I get inundated with all these videos from the Grey Cup festivities right now. Well, well, well let, me, let me give you some background on, on, on a Grey Cup. I've been to 14 of these things, either as a, as a media person or a fan or, or maybe even an official. Um, I had a, a friend of mine from a, from a radio station cluster I was working at. He was over at the Rock Station. He said, I'm going to go to my first Grey Cup festival in Edmonton. He said, I'm going this week. I got to go up there. I've been told I got to go. So, okay. I said, he said, what's it like? I said, okay, this is what happens. He says, I say, there's unique access that you get to people at a great, it's not corporate. It's very anti-corporate. It, it, it's blue collar cosplay. And, and I said, it's the type of thing where, you know, an all-star quarterback or a Hall of Fame quarterback like Danny McManus, some people in Florida will know who Danny McManus is, um, but he played for the Ticats and the Lions and the, and the Bombers up here. Um, he'll be in the corner, just drink a beer out of a red Solo cup. Okay. So he goes to the Grey Cup and comes back and I see him on Tuesday. He says, I walked in the spirit of Edmonton room and I saw Danny McManus in the corner with a red solo cup. And I just walked up to him and I started talking with him. Like it actually duplicated itself. It's somewhat predictable in terms of the way uh, players are just available in the crowd with you. It's, um, it's a different connection and it's a different experience. And the other thing that you know about a, about a gray cup festival is that no matter who your team is, they're all CFL fans. They're, they're, they may be wearing Tiger. They're CFL fans. They're Canada fans. They're too, and you know, there's 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 always the group from Baltimore that shows up every year too to to celebrate that. So it, it it's it, it's it's a treasure for for us uh, culturally, and uh, and and it's and it's a fantastic event. And I really I really think that you guys need to to come up and and see one of these things. It's in Hamilton this year. It'll have a nice gritty blue collar feel to it. Yeah, we'll definitely we'll uh, we'll definitely look into uh, budgeting that in for uh, <laughs> get that YouTube monetization down, and we'll uh, <laughs> we'll be coming up there. Uh, I want to know about you know before all this happened, thoughts on the XFL prior to the last couple of weeks. I mean, did you watch back in 2020? Did you watch the bankruptcy and all that? I mean, besides even the 2001. I mean, I'm talking like current regime. I, th I think 2001 and, and the, the, the second uh, edition of the XFL really bared no resemblance to each other. Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think the, the latest uh, edition of the XFL was well thought out. Um, I love the branding. Uh, for the most part, the facilities that they went into were, <laughs> were a good fit. They were a proper size. I liked what the networks brought in terms of their level of production, even if there wasn't dollar one changing hands to see the, the, the talent and the camera layout and the production layout. It was, it was very well done and had loads of potential and the uh, innovations that they applied, many of which were grabbed from Canadian football uh, were, were all very well thought out. Uh, you know, maybe there's going to be a, some people in Canada that are going to snap back on, on, me on social, but I loved the XFL. Uh, I, now, is it a match of the CFL? That's a different story right now, right? Is there a way to find find a way to make the two of them work? I don't know. But but the XFL second edition, it, it, it created, uh, I think, a great foundation. And if it were not for the pandemic, it would still be going today if Vince was willing to get from A to B and fund it to a point where he could uh, get broadcast money for to to support what they're doing because it's a TV play. It's not it, it's not a grandstand play. It's a TV play. I, I kind of forgot this question when we we're talking about the Rock, um, but the Rock played in the CFL. How? I guess my question is, isn't isn't it in good hands if this this American, as you know, we've we've seen on social media when when people kind of talk down the rock this american isn't it a good fit for someone who under kind of understands the culture of the cfl to kind of come in and help well his his father also has a has a background in canada as well so that the, there's also that um and you know I, i'd be remiss to, to to say that you know he's 
he's aware of of cross cultural um, crossover as as a Samoan American. Um, so uh, I, I think that that that, and I'm assuming this that 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 he'd be open and aware of that, and and to know that that he has a dialogue with Wally Buono, uh, the all time winningest coach in CFL history. I know Wally. I've worked with them on on the Hall of Fame committee, those sorts of things. Uh, known him for for quite some time. Um, while he's not an optimist, he's not a pessimist. He is a smack dab right in the center realist. And if Wally says that in his conversations with Dwayne Johnson, that that Dwayne respects uh, the the culture and the history and what the game is in in Canada, then I'm going to take his word for it. Um, so so I have I have a lot of confidence that that that's going to be the approach do i have solid evidence on that well maybe not maybe there's a lot of things that that could uh, that could take a turn here or there would you prefer just as someone that's you know in canada covered all this part of your life would you prefer the cfl to be able to just kind of figure it out on their own or would you be in favor of this of this potential merger or alliance or whatever you want to call it well, I'm somewhat divided. <laughs> that I, doesn't I hate work. To be you that have way. to have. have no, and, and, and you know what? I think one of the reasons why I'm divided on it is because um, I wear two hats, right? I, I I I have the media role, but I also have the responsibility of being in the president's chair for for amateur football in this country, and you know, uh, from from a from a media role, um, you know. It, it, it's kind of exciting to see the possibility for crossover. Um, you know, way back when 98, uh, I, I want to say there was plans uh, for the world league of American football or NFL Europe or whatever incarnation it was in to actually play a championship game against the CFL champion from the previous season and the preseason. And, and that was canceled about, I want to say about eight weeks out. That was unfortunate. That would have been a lot of fun. Uh, to witness, uh, I think with a with a lot of my personal sentiment about what I see from the XFL and how it how it would how it would show on broadcast and and using my producer's head on this, uh, I think it would be a very compelling product. Um, you know, however, <laughs> you know, let's go over to this other column here. And even you know, even though uh, I've been involved in in international football and I see the the color and the energy. And, and actually how it's the, the, the best untold story uh, of football in, in North America and the world um, and see the response to it. I worry internally in Canada about rule changes. And, and the, 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 even though football is 12-man, 11-man, we go down, we play 11-man all the time. Uh, we've got six-man, which is a great development tool and great for, for small towns. Uh, flag is just taking over and, and, and flag is going to be the, the gateway for anyone that wants to get involved in the game before they cross over, uh, to, to contact football later age. When I take a look at 12 man, still the, the driver of, of football in this country, even with NFL eyes on TVs, 12 man, still the driver, because it's our infrastructure. It's our, it's our fields. It's our training manuals. It's our coaching manuals. It's our officiating. It's our rules. It's our university. There's the 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 the, the worry that I have is there's thinking about the game um, through the American lens, which is you have three very strong pillars in the United States. I think you have 839 college teams, uh, and the and so college can stand on its own. High school football can stand on its own. The NFL can stand on its own. You got a rock solid foundation, right? You got pillars. For us, we've got an ecosystem. Okay. We have 27 university teams. Um, we have uh, junior football, which is uniquely Canadian, uh, which extends to about 19 teams. We've got nine professional teams. And if you take the interdependence out from either of those, the whole thing can go Sounds right. The, the the ratio is important because I look at twenty seven university teams in this country, and they've got enough pressure on them as it is, right? In terms of funding not being available through COVID, in terms of having an unofficial Title IX 
hovering around uh, the sport in this country where there, where there aren't equal numbers of opportunities for women uh, in the sport or other sports. Um, if you want to take away that link of a professional outcome, you're giving an athletic director or an administrator another reason to pull the pin. And the last thing that I want to do right now is be part of something that gives university football in this country the reason to pull the pin on one, two, nine, or 10 programs out of that 27. So that's where my reticence is on a number of these issues, especially the ratio. That makes sense. I'm starting to kind of see how you have it structured there now. It's very similar to how uh, soccer clubs structure their academies and so on and so forth. So I'm kind of starting to understand why there is that, I guess, cultural feel, you know, organizational blowback to what's going on here with the XFL. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I, you know, I don't think it's anything directed against the XFL, certainly not from people in the know about the game. Like, and, and if you're in the know about the game, you were, you were watching what they were doing the last time around and go, wow, this thing could actually have legs if they want to see it through. There's some fun things to this. This thing's presented well. Uh, there's great athletes on the field. There's good coaching here. There, it, this has been thought through. Um, so it's not anything about the, the, the XFL per se. It, it's, it's a need to make sure that we get kids on the field, they play, they develop, we provide opportunities for them. Our main driver from, a, from an amateur perspective is we want you to go uh, either go to college or get a trade through junior and, and, and use football as a vehicle to get an outcome in your life, right? And, and we know that the allure of, or at least a path or an aspirational path to going to the CFL is also a main driver of that. Now, we've had great NFL success stories, too, that have come straight out of, uh, straight out of uh, Canadian University. David Onyemata with the, uh, uh, with the New Orleans Saints is, a, is an example out of, uh, of that. Um, uh, Laurent Duvernay-Tardif, who was one of SI's uh, Athletes of the Year, straight out of McGill. Um, you know, the one thing about uh, uh, our system is that it's driven uh, at the university level. It's driven by academics. We're all kind of quasi uh, Ivy schools when we take our approach to it. So um, it's a different system up here and it's a different culture. And, and so there there are naturally concerns. Yeah, I just I think it's been great to have you on today. It's just a unique perspective from the media and then also from kind of that player side with the amateur and all that. I mean, I do, I do think. Uh, we're doing the best we can to kind of round this conversation, right. And get as many different experts in, in different kind of fields that way. Uh, my last question for you today, since you've been so gracious, you know, with all your time, uh, they just announced, you know, uh, the draft is happening on May 4th. Uh, is that, I mean, gun to your head, is that going to happen? Are we going forward time-wise or, or what's happening in terms of the season starting? Do you think? Well, you know, if you would have asked me on Thursday uh, about the CFL season starting either on time or close to time. I always said, no, absolutely. I would have been 90% sure. Uh, the rise of variants in a number of provinces up here is a huge concern. We're going back into lockdown again. Um, you know, our federal government has been poor in terms of uh, uh, securing uh, vaccines on a timely basis. Um, you know, we'll get there, but it really is that race between variants and vaccines right now. And, and so there's, I'm concerned about what happens at the pro level. I'm concerned what happens at the university level. I've had to cancel, uh, two planned world championships through this pandemic already, uh, for, for U twenties. Uh, I don't want to have to cancel another one that we're planning for, for, for next year. Um, but to, to get um, uh, spring football, uh, which is uh, you know mainly driven by flag, but there's some tackle, some of that off the ground. We need to get past this um, to, to, to have confidence at the high school level that, that superintendents and, and principals are not going to uh, go down the path of, of, of liability to stop kids from playing. That, that's, that's a reality, right? So, so in turn, that's one of the things that I was saying earlier. This isn't just, this isn't just a 
question of, of league. This is a question of sport. This is the entire sport that we're talking about. So, you know, I think it's very important that the CFL for, for the health of our sport finds a way to, to get on the field. There may be things that are bigger than us that get in the way, at least doing that on time. But even if it means a 16 game season or a 14 game season or a 10 game season or pushing it two weeks later, I, I believe they're going to find a way to do it because the, 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 the risk of not doing anything is just way too much at this stage. Completely agree. All your insight is appreciated. Jim Mullen, a TSN host, and of course, prestigious president of football Canada. Prestigious. Yeah. <laughs> take your time. I love Vancouver. I've been a few times. I love it up there. And uh, uh, next time, you know, I'm in the area. Uh, yeah. Let's grab a beer or some Timbits, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm awesome. Here. Come on, come on. I'm over on Bowen Island. I'm about, uh, I'm about a 20 minute ferry ride from, uh, from Vancouver. Cool. We'll, we'll, we'll get you into the wilderness here and have you over for a few beer. Thank get, you. Get me out of this concrete jungle that's called Los Angeles. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your time today. Really appreciate all your expertise. And guys, anytime you get any questions, come to me at any time. Perfect. Thank you so time. much. Stay safe.